attacking somebody from the front means that they're completely aware of who you are and what you're doing, or maybe not. In my case, I want to use the element of surprise. Being a small woman, someone this size, a man this size, is not going to necessarily expect me to attack him first, especially if he's a predator. He's going to be thinking, oh, okay, it's on, I got you. And I want him to think that. So maybe as I'm approaching him, I'm asking him for something, or he's already looking at me, or whatever the case may be, I don't want him to think that I'm willing to attack him. When I do that, and I get close enough, his guard is automatically down, or he's waiting for the opportune moment, and I'm not going to give him that. And I'm not going to give him that, when I hit to the windpipe in the throat at the same time, he's going to have a very hard time reacting to that, because when you hit some guy in the groin, this is naturally what happens. You hit someone in the windpipe, this is what happens. When you hit both simultaneously, they're going to have a very miserable day. After you hit here, oh. secure the groin. Make sure that you've got it. Make sure you've got the windpipe. And when I say make sure you've got the windpipe, I mean this. My thumb is digging into the side of his windpipe, and I've got a natural handle here. Okay? I want to hang on to that. Okay? From here, palm grab, pull the groin, and hang on. From there, I sweep, and I drive him down by the groin of the windpipe. Hey, Jimbo here. I've got an awesome free YouTube giveaway for the first 200 guys. It's the world's fastest drawing pocket knife. Quicker than any switchblade. We call it the Striker. And with your permission, I will now rush you this amazing knife for free. Just pay shipping and handling and it's on its way to your front door. But get to the link in the description now if you want one. We're going to have a mass attack situation. It's going to be a lousy scenario. And we're going to do everything the wrong way first. I believe if you see the contrast, that will help you internalize the right way. So what we're going to do is what the average person would do. And that is, once I hit the ground, because I'm going to get sucker punched from the side, I'm not even going to know when. I've instructed one of my guys to just clobber me. Once I get sucker punched, he's going to hit the ground with me, and I'm going to wrestle. I'm going to wrestle without throwing any Kino Mutai in, and my goal is going to be I'm going to try to come to my feet. But you're going to see that it's a lot more difficult than you think. It takes a while to actually close the deal if you stay in pure ground fighting. So while I'm trying to come to my feet, struggling, the assailant that just hit me is going to have a friend coming from the south end of the bar, and he's just going to start wailing on me, and then I'm going to be stuck on the ground with four punches thrown at me and I'll inevitably lose the fight. And that's gonna be the wrong way to handle it. Then we'll turn around and we'll show you the right way. So, here we go. Now, as you saw in the last scenario, I don't care if you're Bruce Lee, if you're sitting there talking to somebody, you get sucker punched from the rear, they knock you on the ground, somebody engages you on the ground, you're struggling. If you don't know how to get back up, you're going to be stuck on the ground. That's what Kena Mutai is all about. Remember, the name of this tape is Brutal Solutions. These are for the scenarios that are not exactly what we want, okay? Two on one, ground fighting, attack from the rear, sucker punched. This is all the kind of shit that happens in a real fight. I'm gonna be on the ground now. This time I'm gonna engage in Kina Mutai. When Robert comes in, he clobbers me, he's gonna be on the ground, I'm gonna grab and I'm gonna bite. Okay, I'm gonna create space, kick him off. Aaron will warn me about the predator coming from behind, I'm gonna turn around and engage on that person and enter into my normal routine, some kind of straight blast, headbutt, knee or elbow. Okay, so follow with me, notice the difference in the scenario and watch how it turns out this time. The only difference is one bite. out a lot better for me that time and literally the only thing that was the difference between round one and round two 
was a bite right on the chest. Okay, keep that in mind. Second notice about this awesome giveaway I'm conducting for the first 200 guys who respond. Get to the link in the description and I will rush you this stunning striker pocket knife for free. Just pay shipping and it's on its way to your front door. This is a $70 knife, eight and a half inches long, cutlery grade steel, G10 handle, total quality. You can also draw this blazing fast if you want. I'll show you how. There's a strict limit of 200 to go around. So get to the link in the description now. Okay, the right hand comes. We're just gonna parry the right hand off. And then I'm gonna close in. It's kind of a little bump and grind thing I do. We're gonna take the other hand and push this way. But I'm gonna let that hand slide right down here. See, I'm blocking with my body now. And I'm holding this shoulder so he doesn't spin on me. And I'm gonna go bang and hit him in the groin. Just gonna take my hand, hit him in the groin really hard. Then I'm gonna take my hand, I'm gonna do the bitch slap right in his face, bang. The head's gonna go up and then you're just gonna hit the throat and rip and tear, right? When you're ripping and tearing on the throat, you, first of all, when you hit, it's, it's a possibility you may cave the windpipe in. That, that within itself is gonna shut this fight down. If they can't breathe, they're done. So you, after you go here, bang. You know, you can either take the throat if it's available or shoot for the eyes, knowing the head's gonna go back and back into the throat. Make sure you always hit the throat first. And then I like to take my thumb Go behind the Adam's apple and just pinch it off and rip, okay? So you just kind of grip, twist, and turn, and pull. That's how you're going to handle that. So when he comes in, once again, I'm doing this, bang, slap, and it's pretty much a done deal. If I want to throw him on the ground, probably be able to do that. Get a reverse angle. As he comes in, he throws, I block here. Once again, it's just like this, slap, just, just push. Don't push way over here. Don't let your hands get too far from your face. Just slap. He, he can heat that punch up a little bit. Slap, right? Once again, change angle just a little bit. He shoots a punch. And you want to move your head. I have to tell you, always move your head in case your block doesn't work. If I'm standing here, he punches at me. <laughs> move something, right? So don't just stand here like a robot and go, oh, he still hit me, right? So when he punches, I move a little bit, bang, right? The other hand circles underneath. And all it does is this, it's two moves, bang. And I'm already to the groin, I actually got some that time. Back to the eyes and back to the throat, right? So it's just like this, block, move your head, block. So it's same hand. If his right hand's coming in, it's like looking in a mirror. I'm just gonna push it to the inside. If he shoots his left hand, I'm just gonna push it to the inside. And as I push it to the inside, his other hand, slips up above his elbow as I'm getting close to him, and then come right down here. So if you want to speed that up a little bit, he shoots the right hand here, bang, right? I can go back here if I want, back here. But you've got all kinds of great things that you can do if you get close to him. Remember, I'm sitting here, I look up, he's just, and I know it's coming, right? It's coming, he shoots again, bang. Always go to the groin, get him bent down. In his case, he's very aggressive, I'm gonna end up doing something a little different, but as long as you get a good growing shot down, you can even grab it and, and, and just bust it, just, just squeeze him till he's on his knees. Okay, just to follow up on what our, our, our uh, defenses against looping or just wild ass right hands, the first defense was we're gonna corkscrew. Now Roger's gonna, gonna work a little bit. Remember, we're just gonna twist, turn our body, and I say corkscrew into the Right in here, the lower part of the arm, just below the bicep and above the elbow. It's really painful. So when I start swinging, boom, he's in. And he's really in. Once he hits, he's twist turning his body and blocking out my next potential punch. And he's raking me and he's cracking me with either a hand or he's gonna be hitting me with a, a, a hammer fist. And in this case, I'd probably use a hammer fist because it's already there. That's probably taking me on down. I, it feels pretty rough. So it's block. Hit, hammer fist, bang. I'll tell you what, that hammer fist, he's actually landing that hammer fist right back here. And I want you to know that that's serious business, right? So that's what we want to practice. Guy throws, he's into it, block, hit, and bang. Now, if once he gets me over here, if he wants to continue to knee, then I'd, I'd encourage to work those tactics. Anytime we can get in here and he can do something, then he should do it. 
and then it's, it opens up uh, other possibilities. But when it's all said and done, it's probably going to push me to the ground, either run away or you know, kick me a few times and then run away. Make sure I can't re-engage in the fight, remember? Okay, the next one, we do our little blocks where he parries it to the inside, he goes to the outside, he slaps to the, the groin, he comes up to the eyes and face, and he slams into the throat and he rips. And then whatever after that happens. If I, was, if I was pulling back down this way, I may pull down and start hammering to the back of the head because those really hurt. Okay, so we speed it up a little bit. I punch, slap, face, throat. Right, good. Okay, how's it feel? Works pretty good. So you just want to work the initial setup, kind of break it in bits and pieces. First step is parry and then step, you know, slide in on them. Again, I want to change angles so you can look at the opposite angle. He's going to shoot. He's inside already slap, right? Again, we shoot in. Roger's doing a really good job. He's tearing up my leg. And I'm glad he's not in my private area. Okay? So that's why we want to set that up. It's important that you understand how to go down to the ground and how to follow a takedown and remain on the offensive for if the actions of the enemy and the confrontation itself, and a lot of it's dictated by the terrain that you're actually fighting on, when it go, when, if, if it does in fact go down to the ground, that you, you do maintain control and you end up in a position where you're gonna dominate your opponent on the ground. These are typically initiated, all these takedowns, because of the instinctive actions from our shooting platform if he encroaches onto me and we start, we start clinching and grappling on the top line, a lot of times, based on terrain, you may just fall down to the ground. But it's important that you do it in a controlled way. The second thing is a lot of times the opponent's going to try to take you down to the ground. And so when I feel his momentum trying to take me down, I don't necessarily want to continue to fight it. If I fight it, especially if he's a good grappler and knows something about grappling, it's going to be worse for me. He is going to take me down to the ground. That's something that we can't afford to do. So what we're going to try to do is I'll teach you four different takedowns and throws that you can do when you feel the opponent or that you feel the enemy taking you down to the ground. You can maintain control, go down to the ground with him, but the entire time you're staying on the offensive and you're in control. The first one, from a clinch position, from the one in, one out, over, over wrap. It's more of a traditional hip throw, and we've come, but we've kind of thrown in, thrown in a few uh, other techniques and aspects to it. Number one, we're never looking for a hip throw, okay? This is, this is kind of a least preferred way of getting somebody down to the ground, but a lot of times because of the body weight and shift, he's right up on me, okay? So I'm gonna show you two different methods of actually doing this hip throw. Number one, when he comes in tight and he's, get, he's putting pressure on me, I have nowhere to go. I shoot this hand past him, I bring it around, and both hands are clenching his tricep. I kick my feet into the middle and I punch my hip into I get up under him, I'm lifting him up off the ground, and I'm circling him. But if you notice, as soon as he gets down on the ground, I'm pinning, I'm placing my knee into his body so I can continue to control. And from this position, I can continue to hit. Okay, but if, if, if you also notice, it's not like a judo throw. I'm not trying to get him up in the air and get him on the ground. If he doesn't leave the ground at all, that's fine, as long as I can accomplish my throw. From the clinch position, we're moving around. I can't get him, I might land a knee. <clears throat> That'll gel him a little bit. I'll shoot that hand across, grab him, get my hips up and under him, flip him over, pin him with my knee. If you notice, I'm still controlling his off arm. From this position, I can continue to hit, and I can push off and break away. I scan for other enemy or secondary threats. Again, one more time. From a clinch position, remember, I just don't want to stand here and wrestle, so I'm putting in shots. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gelling him. I shoot that hand past. This may have been a complete accident because he encroached. He's trying to grab my body. I'm maintaining control of his off hand. I take my, my strong hand and it can even wrap around, grab as tight as it can. Another little trick is to wrap around and grab my shirt just to maintain control, just in case we don't go to the ground. I turn, I get my hips up and under him, and I just get him to where he's off balance, and I flip him over off the ground. And I maintain, I put my knee in his chest, and I start pounding him to make sure. Now, this is still, once we're in this position, this is not a knee control position. I need to get my body weight above him where my, my thigh is perpendicular, putting pressure on you, okay? Putting pressure directly on him. And this is where I'm going to lay the head again. I'm just going to start hitting him. 
Okay, and then I'm gonna break away. I'm watching, I'm watching for my secondary threats. We do not wanna go to the ground and grapple. One of the biggest mistakes people make with this particular throw is that when I go up and over, I'll, I'll commit too much to it, and I'll go down with you. Okay, and it completely reverses the throw. So what we want to do when we do this throw is we want to maintain control of his body, and we really don't want to throw him with a lot of force. Only that force necessary to get him off the ground, get him around, and get him under control, and start laying the hate and hitting him so that we can back away, start looking for secondary threats. That's more of a very traditional throw. The little thing we're going to put in there that changes it is that when I switch to kick him over, I'm taking my forearm, putting it on the back side of his head. So when I, when I do throw him, I'm landing, my body is landing, my forearm and elbow are landing on his head. One more time real slow. Okay, I turn, I switch my elbow. So that when he does go over, my elbow's landing on him, and I'm maintaining control, and I'll kick up and I'll put my knee on his chest, I'll lay the hate, and I'll back out. Final chance at getting a free striker knife. It's a $70 knife. It's one of the fastest drawing pocket knives in the world and it's yours for free. Just pay shipping to get this to your front door and I'll rush one out to you right away. I started with only 200 knives to go around. There are still some left, so get to the link in the description while you can. I'll see you inside. Next, we're gonna talk about fighting stances and footwork. Now, if you're into martial arts at all, you know there are hundreds of fighting stances. It's kind of ridiculous because the human body only works a certain way. We all have four limbs, you know, and we operate the same conditions. Some stances can be of value, but for the most part, we need to understand a couple things about stances in relationship to real world violence. All right, so I want to ask you a question right up front. Is this a fighting stance? You bet, right? How about this? How about this? How about tying my shoe? Is that a fighting stance? You bet your ass it's a fighting stance. Because in the real world, you don't square up with somebody like you do in the ring or in MMA. Fights happen explosively or escalating, but they happen suddenly. And often, you're not prepared and you're not ready. This itself should be a fighting stance. The point is, positions that you may fight from are happened by accident, that happened by incident or by intentional. In other words, I may be standing here and somebody throws a punch and by accident I have to be here. All right? I may trip and fall and somebody may put me in a position. I may be on the ground and that's an accidental position that I may have to fight from. An incident may be I just get pushed or shoved and I'm leaning back and he's trying to punch me in the face. Well that right there is also a fighting stance. Intentional stances are what we're more commonly will know as you know, positions we'll put ourselves in, and those are positions of advantage. Now, the point here really being is you need to be able to that you need to be able to fight no matter what happens to you, and you need to do it when you need it. But also, we do want to stack the deck in our favor whenever we can, and that's what we're going to do with this fighting position. Essentially, there are some components, but the principles are simple. I want to maintain a balanced position as much as I can. Contrary to popular belief, I'd sure as hell rather stay on my feet than on the ground. People say every fight goes to the ground, but I guarantee you one thing, almost all fights start standing up. So you want to try to stay up if you can. There's really few instances in which there's an advantage on the ground. And remember, you're often not fighting in a cage or a ring. You're fighting on concrete with glass and furniture and things around you that can hurt you if you go down. Not only that, there may be more than one person. Imagine what would happen if we threw a, into the ring with an MMA fighter and we change the ring. We said, hey, we're going to make a concrete floor here, and we're going to put a sharp metal table, and we're going to put glasses and things around. See what happens with that fight. See what happens when the fireman carry and I drop to the ground and I hit my knee and shatter it on the concrete floor. That's what happens in the real world. All right? That's the difference between sport and reality. So you've got to understand that we want to try to stay on our feet, and we want to try to be in a position of advantage. So let's talk about some of the things that can help you stay there. Let's talk briefly about stances for combat situations. Um, what people don't realize is you have stances that happen by accident, stances that happen by incident, and uh, stances that are intentional. All right, so when someone goes into karate school and say, let me teach you the horse stance, that's an intentional fighting position. 
All right, so we're actually saying, hey, if you get in a fight, get into this position, and what are we trying to do? We're trying to get in a position of advantage over our adversary, right? So you can do certain things from this position, you can't do certain things from that position. So an accidental position is, uh, I didn't see the fight coming, um, I'm sitting at a table, all of a sudden someone shoves me, pulls my back over the table, and I'm on my back, and they're trying to punch me. Well, now you're in a fighting stance. Now you actually have to fight from sitting back on a chair in there. So you got to think of that also as a fighting stance. Incidental is I happen to be standing, you know, in this weird position, just sitting here like this. I'm, let's say I'm sitting here. Somebody reaches across the table. Well, you know what? This is a fighting stance. My whole point is that stances really don't matter. The whole idea of a stance is to be able to function. So. Function is more important than form. So if you're learning stance because you want to be in some form and position, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is your ability to use this position, to have a position of advantage, and use it effectively. I mean, in our school, we teach people how to fight from the fighting stance, but we also teach neutral from reaction training position. We teach them uh, from all sorts of different positions, sitting, standing, in your car. Now you've got to fight from here, okay? Because that's how the real world works. Now, again, if the fight is not an explosive fight, or you, you see it coming, you can get into a proper fighting position very, very quickly. Nothing wrong with that, and absolutely that's just the smartest thing in the world. So the human body operates the same way. Until somebody grows a third arm out their chest, everybody operates under the same physics and the same body mechanics. So understanding that, there are certain positions that are, that are bad, certain positions that are better, and certain positions that are best, right? So, we always want the best. So there are different stances for different reasons, different ways I may use my techniques or tactics effectively. But for our position, we're simply going to adopt a universal, general, combat-ready position in which we have a drive leg, we have our hands up between us and our adversary, and we have the proper distance between our feet facing and tracking them. It's a really simple concept, and you'll see that in the video. But let me talk briefly about footwork. Um, if you go to a traditional martial arts school, there may be an awful lot of footwork, and sometimes that's fun, but as you know, it's kind of unnecessary. It's kind of like going to the Arthur Murray School of, of Martial Arts Footwork and Dance, right? Footwork is very, very simple, if you think about it. It's not a hard concept. So if I adopt a fighting stance and position, right, the footwork means I want to maintain that position as much as possible, which means do as little as you can if you move. So don't cross your feet, don't change the angle, because that dramatically changes your fighting position. Why would I want to do that? Because that's maybe the very moment that I get punched in the head. So the idea of footwork is keep it simple. If this is a stable, mobile position, then stay there and learn how to move your feet quickly either direction and use it. So when you're in this video, we don't even discuss that, because I want it to be as natural as possible. The only thing we do discuss is I prefer that if you're right-handed, you hold the weapon in your right hand. If you're left-handed, you hold it in your left. And it also means the opposing leg is back. So if I've got it in my right hand, my left leg is back. My left hand, the right leg is back. Why? Because you don't want to be twisted around and you've got massive reach off this one side. You want to use this range of motion off this side as effectively. But if I'm holding in the back, I've limited my range of motion in, in use, right? So front hand use, drive leg, track them. Thanks for watching our video lessons here at TRS Direct. Hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to our channel here on YouTube. Hit the bell icon and we'll send you a notification when there's a new lesson available. Thanks again for watching.